Welcome back to the Valorant channel. I know that I haven't posted in a while, but I knew that I wanted to make something about Sunset, the new map that's been released. So I watched a bunch of the 10 Global Invitational VODs, and I watched some of the VODs that were happening in EMEA as well in the Red Bull Home Grounds. But there wasn't one team that I felt had really solved the map yet. Makes sense. It's a brand new map, right? So instead, what I want to do is make two videos. This is the first part where I talk through the process of what we're learning on this map, of the different kind of ideas that we're seeing, the different compositions that are being presented on Sunset, because I think it's a sick map, and I think there's tons of innovation possible here. And I think anytime you get a new map, it's just interesting to see what kind of ideas the pro teams come out with it. A lot of people have been theorizing that Double Smokes look really good here. A lot of people have been theorizing that Breach looks awesome or other things like that. <laughs> So I want to take you through some of the top teams in the world playing on this map, some of the partnership teams in decent off-season events to see what the best ideas look like and how you might apply some of them to your ranked games. Um, and the idea being that in this first video, I'm going to take you through some of the main comps and some of the main ideas. And then in the second video, we'll dive into a bit more of the details of like if you're going to play this in Premiere or what the pros are actually doing, right? So the first one should be a little more applicable to your ranked games and the kind of compositions that you would be thinking about using. So let's dive straight in. So what comps are people running? So this is a VOD that I've pulled from the 10 Global Invitational. And you can see here that it's Cloud9 playing against EDG. And these compositions look reminiscent almost of something that you might see on like a Lotus, something like that, where you have quite slow paced compositions that segment up the map with the double smokes and slowly take map control, kind of like how uh, Fnatic were playing Lotus in the past, especially if you look at EDG's composition. I mean, apart from the chamber that they're running, which a lot of people are running, and I'll explain why in a bit, uh, this really does look like a Lotus comp. You have the Omen and the Viper working together. You have Raze and you have Fade, who are going to be working together as well. And then Kang Kang is playing uh, the chamber there too. On the other side of things, though, there is a slight difference. We've got the Harbor being played here by Jake, and I think the Harbor actually ends up being better uh, all round. We'll dive into that a little bit down the road. Um, bigger ultimates, better uh, blocking off of angles with the high tide and with the cascade compared to the omen as well. Potential for getting down better plant spots with the uh, with the cove too. But there are actually a couple of other teams doing some stuff that's more creative, or maybe not even more creative, just different, frankly. Where Foot are running a composition without a chamber entirely, where they're running a sage and a breach. Well, again, we'll dig into that towards the end of the video because I want to focus on these kind of comps because this does appear to be the meta that a lot of, at least the teams that will participate in the 10 Global Tournament are going with where maybe you make a change to what one of the smokes is, maybe you make a slight tweak between the sky and the fade, but generally speaking, this is looking like a bit of a meta comp. So why would that be? Let's first take a look at some of the like classic defensive setups that people are using here. Right? I've just dived into Valorplant, and I'm showing you one of the basic setups that Cloud9 were using, where they have the trademark being able to get information if anybody tries to go towards market. They have the sky in the chamber being able to post up towards B main with a flash for information, and then the chamber setting up on a deeper line. You have the high tide here, which allows you prio over mid control. So they have to push through that. They don't have vision, the attackers. They also can't really get out through tiles very easily. It's very good for um, just conditioning your opponents to not take early mid control or be a little cautious about it. And then you've got a defensive setup over here where, to be honest, this orb is really uh, dependable, like where you want to put it. Some people even go for a cross map kind of setup as well. But generally speaking, this is the kind of wall that Vanity was going for with Oxy here using Boombot for some information in the mid round. And there's tons of different defensive setups that you could go for. Here's another one where you have the Viper over towards B, where you've got um, the Viper and the Sky working together, as you would see on maybe like Bind B site, for example, where the Sky is going to get information down B long, but actually if the site hit comes through, you're relying on the Viper to really hold down that area, and this is a very obnoxious choke point to get through. Look, if you've got a wall that they can use to kind of cross back to the other side, you know, anytime this wall is up, you can go for a walk down here. You've got an orb in your face. On the other side of the map, the chamber's got a fantastic setup. They're one of the biggest reasons that chamber ends up getting used, and again, we'll look at some gameplay footage later on, but this chamber's going to get a really deep sight line here with their rendezvous, and then a trademark in case they get pushed off the line as well. Um, um, and can be supported by other people to be able to either keep that line or get on that line a little better too. And generally speaking, it does end up being your duelist and your secondary smokes player, um, the Omen or the Harbor, who are more of the floaty players in these defensive setups. But it does depend on kind of what you're up to. 
And here's a very common attacking setup as well with a similar kind of map. This is me just grabbing a kind of random 131 default that EDG do. Not that they 131 very often, they actually more 4 1 hit. But this is a 131 where you have, again, the value of the rendezvous here, allowing Kankang to be able to contest down B main. Then you have the, the trio in mid, which are going to be able to smoke off up towards the top of mid, have one player come up tiles and two players come up towards the front of mid so that you're controlling these kind of angles. And then you have a, a, a prowler which can inform a paranoia coming through and then the blind person gets haunted and it pushes people back over here you have the boom bot as well so uh, and then you're going to be able to take market control fairly effectively on the other side of things the viper this is one of the most standard viper offensive setups where you have a smoke over here and a wall over here in some kind of setup similar to this which makes it much more difficult for the chamber that we talked about previously who's going to be trying to pick this line to get set up because they have to walk through your orb you know they can't uh, they're going to be blind at the beginning of the round. They have to be in a more extended position where they can get caught by utility, that kind of thing. So I wanted to break down a little bit of like why people are using these kind of compositions um, in more detail than just showing you guys some Valor plan, right? I feel like people are more likely to be visual learners and learn from the experience of watching the game. So let's have a look at this. So here's just a really simple season aid kind of combo that EDG string together. One of the big reasons why you might want to play Raise Fade on a map like this. So they realize that Whippy... And Zeppa here are further forwards with the horn. They seize, they nade, they find Zeppa in the corner. They isolate that. Really effective, really standard usage of how you want to use your raise and your fade on maps like this. So makes sense. Here's another kind of situation where they're doing the same kind of thing, this time against FPX, where FPX have pushed up deep into um, B main here. And they've put this one way up. I'm not huge on this one way. I feel like there's room enough. If you take a look at the minimap, actually, there's room enough at the back here. Like if you're an attacker and you position yourself here, you can kind of see underneath this one way and it doesn't really get the, the most amount of value. But it's definitely something that people are experimenting with and using quite a lot in the pro games and something that you might want to try on your rank game as well because I know that people in rank games are not going to be as good at breaking it as uh, EDG are right here. So EDG, you can see them. They set up for something here. They have nobody's horned. Nobody throws the haunt through the window. Smoggy's going to blast pack through. It's combo with a paranoia as well. So the paranoia catches onto him. The haunt is up in the window there. And then Smoggy's going to blast pack through, be able to find this player and the completely crack this setup. And not just that, they then follow through with the showstopper, which you could argue is a bit of an overinvestment in this kind of situation. But they managed to get it done. They crack open the site. Really good value out of the... Uh, fade in this kind of situation. You can see why it would get played on this map, especially when people are running so much raise here. Um, let's just have another look at why fade can be extremely good on this map when, when comboed with the raise. So we're going to see on this round, just to prep you for what's coming, you've got uh, the nightfall up here. So nightfall on a really big kind of sight lines that you can make this work. And you'll see at the beginning of the round, we have a prowler. Smoggy follows the prowler through, so he doesn't have to be worried about any kind of chamber setup. Then we see a Nightfall, and for here, for this one, I'm going to bring up the minimap just so that you can see this a little better. So the Nightfall comes through, and then watch this Haunt positioning as well. The Haunt is thrown, and that's going to land right there. Now, this is on top of a really high wall at the top of A that sees everything. I mean, this Haunt sees it all. It's a fantastic Haunt position. It can be used for A execs. It can be used in a similar spot around here for A retakes as well. It's extremely good. A very powerful. Clears out a lot of the site and it informs a lot of the way in which EDG like to get onto the sites. Now, most of the teams are actually not playing this. Most of the teams are playing um, Sky on this map, but I wanted to show you some of the, the fade stuff so that you know that it's not just a gimmick. It's actually really powerful and you can even see on the minimap here that... Uh, uh, nobody's using the Prowlers as well, just to put additional pressure on these players over towards A. So then, why are people using the Sky so much? Well, in any composition where you have double smokes, you're gonna see a lot of Sky. That was the meta for all of last year. We saw Viper Harbor Sky compositions being played. Flashes through smokes are just super powerful. I mean, this is just incredibly default, incredibly powerful kind of stuff. You also have this Sky Flash, which is really good. If I pull up the minimap here, um, you'll be able to see that this sky flash is being sent through B main. The idea being to gather information in this kind of area. And watch this flash here. Here it is, the little birdie. And see how 
precise it is of being able to get information on Kankan. Kan. This is right at the beginning of the round. The timing is good, and Zeppa uses this flash quite a lot to be able to get good information in B. Uh, on this round, yeah, you only know that there's one person there, but if you hear nothing and you're pretty confident that the flash is good, maybe that's going to inform you to play a bit more aggressive. Maybe that's going to inform this guy to rotate off and play towards market a bit more. You know, there's, there's a lot of good information that you can get off the back of this, and especially because this is an area where the chamber is going to try to contest a lot. So, again, good information from the sky flashes that you're going to see a lot of the time. And because people play so much chamber, the sky is really good at setting up and countering the opponent chamber. So let's just look at a couple of examples of this. This is a chamber battle that we're seeing in B main right now. So a flash that's trying to put pressure on the attackers. A dog that's trying to put take Whippy off his angle. Whippy respects it, backs off, dog gets broken. And Carpe sets up on a more aggressive angle here. So the attackers have won this map control. So now we're going to see another example where the defenders respond a little differently and Carpe doesn't anticipate that. So the same kind of flash comes through to try and set Carpe up on the angle here, right? Whippy gets flashed, but Whippy's going to call this time to get re-popped onto the angle instead of just backing up. The flash pops, Carpe dodges it, but in that split second, Whippy's taken the line, he's now favored in the fight, and when Carpe goes to peek back in, Whippy takes the uh, takes the kill. So you're going to see a lot of these trades, and also think about how much Sky Utility was just used at the start of this round. And yes, in this example, it ended in a kill, but a lot of the times, it's just going to end in one team giving up map control, right? And you're going to end up exchanging a lot of Sky Utility for... Um, a portion of the map and that is going to be one of the big themes about using sky on this map if you're playing sky uh, the higher level you go the more you're going to have to use early round utility for map control because the areas on sunset where you fight are really kind of small close areas so this is the chamber on the other side of the map as well this is what I would consider the most default A setup. I showed you it before where you have the rendezvous here and it allows Kang Kang to go for this peak. If you're playing chamber, this is going to be your standard setup. Notice in this instance though, that Vanity has not used a poison orb, the Viper orb, where Kang Kang is stud. So this is one of the big reasons why Vipers will normally orb this spot so that you can't get away with this. But here, Kankan Kan just swings out, and now he's in a super safe position. It's fantastic for rendezvous usage. And this is how people are getting around the fact that the Viper Orb is being used. They're pushing the area with the wall instead. So Viper Orb goes on the other side. So you can see here that if, you know, if Kankan Kan had gone for this push this time, there's a Viper, wall, uh, Viper Orb sorry, in his face. Whippy's already anticipated that because he knows that that's something that EDG like to do. And so Whippy's fighting in front of the Viper Wall on the opposite side. And by mixing these up and trying to read the opposing, uh, opponent, uh, not just Viper, but where they're throwing the Boombot or where they're throwing the um, Prowlers or anything like that, User Chamber are going to be able to outplay your opponents and get into positions where you can find those early picks. And listen, even if nobody comes in your area, you're still providing huge, huge amounts of value to your team because if you get posted on this line and there's nobody there, the rest of your team only has to worry about this portion of the map. And that makes Sunset really small, really, really small. So let's take a look now at a different example. And some of the value that chamber can get once you're deeper into the round so this is over 40 seconds into the round here there's 53 seconds on the clock and kang kang has previously used his rendezvous to be able to take a little bit of map control he's pulled it back up or possibly he didn't even use it this round i can't quite remember but now he's going to use it for the exec he can't quite see very clearly because again there's no replay viewer in this game but i'm going to try and walk you through it here's kang kang in b main his team are going to try and go for a b pop and he wants to kind of use his rendezvous as if it's a jet dash and I'm not saying that this is anything particularly game-breaking or new or innovative, but what it is is useful on Sunset B. Because when you take a look at how the map is actually designed, if you put your rendezvous here and you're trying to entry onto B, well, it's not like A, where you might put your rendezvous down and you might have to scale quite a distance away from your rendezvous. The way that B works is that you can actually swing out quite wide onto one side of it, and you're still, if you think about how you're pathing you know, in the game, you're going to be pathing like this and still in the in the radius of this big fat rendezvous that you've got put down. And you can see a lot of different sight lines. You know, you can look over towards market, you can look over towards this side of pillar, you can be clearing out towards this side of pillar as well, all while staying inside your rendezvous. So it's not that Kankan's doing anything particularly innovative here, but it's that the map works really well for it. And another reason why I think Chamber is pretty valuable here. So take a look, pay attention, Kankan. Right now, is just popping down his rendezvous. I mean, you can barely see it tucked behind Haodong there, but that is the rendezvous. 
and then he's gonna swing out through the choke point help the rest of his team trade gets the trade onto blin goes back into b main in case he himself was about to get traded and here we'll talk a bit more about this exec of the future about how the double smokes composition works but just to focus on kang kang he's able then to get back outside post up back on the same angle again kills ah yang excellent a exec whilst getting value out of the chamber so I said that we were going to talk a bit about double smokes. Well, why are double smokes used on this map so much? So let's look back at the Valor plan and really dig into what's going on with the smokes here. So this is a bit of a setup over towards A, right? So again, I said this Viper Orb is super, like, movable. You could put it here, maybe, to stop them going up towards the here. You could put the Viper Orb over this side as well to make it really difficult for the attackers to scale up the left. Or you can put it here so that you have an option to try to flood defend into the side. Or play Ratty inside your smoke. I think any of those options are pretty good, as well as trying to rotate it around the map a little more and play spread, which we'll talk about in a sec. But here... You've got this portion is a bit annoying for the attackers to come through. And uh, and also this portion is going to be a bit of a bother as well. You've also got some options to play retake here because it lets you into the site and kind of cuts off this position. So this is one that Cloud9 were using fairly often uh, on the defense side. And the harbor again, as we said, allowing you prio in mid and giving you so many different options on the attack side. So here's an alternate setup on um, B main, which I think is very good. Uh, the B main setup here, you have a wall that allows you, as a Viper, or basically as anybody, you could leave this for your chamber and sky as well. Every, anytime this wall is up, the attackers who are coming from this direction have to think you could have crossed over here. So they can use a bunch of utility to clear out B main fully, and as soon as this wall goes back up, you're threatening that you could walk, again, behind this box or out onto an off angle or anything like that. And even if they manage to get people in positions here and here, ready to pop into B main, you then have your Viper Orb in their face and you have your Snake Bites in their face as well. This is a really annoying Viper setup to get through if you want to hard anchor towards B. It, it synergizes really well, and you can also leave it for teammates and go and play on another part of the map if you want to. Um, and specifically, it works really well on Sunset because you have another great defensive tool to lock down the other side of the map, which is your chamber over there. Um, let's have a look then at uh, the attack sided setup. Like I said, you've got your main setup, which is Viper Orb here and a wall in this kind of area. Now, there is another wall that you can throw. You know, you can tilt this wall slightly so that you have it something like this. Um, I saw a few teams doing this kind of setup as well. Uh, EDG were kind of swapping between one or the other. I don't think there's too much difference between them, to be honest with you. Maybe one will end up becoming massively meta uh, once some certain quirks are kind of worked out with the map. Uh, there, there are some like funky spots here, like funky spot here as well. You can't really hold this even if you put the wall there because you just don't have good angles over towards it. So th there's pros and cons, but I don't think it really matters. At the end of the day, this Viper setup is to control this area because one of the unique parts about Sunset again is that if the defenders lose control of this choke point, suddenly it branches into two it bifurcates and now the defenders have to worry about being pinched and it's so much so much more difficult for them to re-clear a if you lose this information another reason why chamber is great here because you can actually try to hold on to that spot um and then you know in the attacking setups you can have your harbor go for walls like this you can have your omen smoke here smoke here have your harbor go, you know, towards market and smoke like this. There's just so many other things that a harbor or an omen can do after your Viper puts down a default setup towards A or towards B. Um, so I wanted to take a look at this round as well and show you how Vanity was playing a cross-map setup whilst playing Viper. So here he is, the busy little B up here, if we have a look on the mini-map. This is Vanity, and he's going to try and put down a wall that goes like this that we've already showed before. Then he's going to try and run and put a snake bite at the bottom of mid to help uh, his team have full mid control at the start of the round. And then he's going to run back and put his orb over here. So he is properly everywhere on the map. And just watch him running around here trying to get it all done in a reasonable time uh, he's got 20 seconds now to put it all down he takes a little while just lining up the orb he could definitely do this a little faster but to be honest it doesn't matter too much because he still wants to be there at zero seconds to fire the snake bite anyway so he's there in plenty of time this does create a bit of a problem if the attackers decide to go for a hard b push but he feels fairly confident that that's not going to be the case in this kind of instance pops down the snake bite along with the harbor wall to allow Jake a bit of control in mid, and then he runs back over towards B, 
And he's going to be throwing his Viper Orb that now lands here. So he's being able to have impact all across the map. And yes, he is weak to a B, a fast B hit coming through. But by the time they've fought through, you know, a flash that's going to pop here and been worried about any chamber that might be set up on the line, because obviously that's something that the defenders could be playing with. One, by the time they've really de dealt with that, if you look at the overall time on the clock, this is 15 seconds into the round and the Viper Orb is now in position. So it's probably going to be fine, except... Uh, if they're going for a very fast B hit. And this isn't the only setup that Vanity uses. This is just one of the variety of setups that he was going for. And I really liked Cloud9's variety of defensive setups in this map. I think they were definitely doing the best on defense. Um, I don't know whether the numbers back that up, but I think they had the best ideas on defense, I should say. And now, if you're not running this kind of... Um, actually, no, let's, let's have a look just another time at the... Um, viper attack b setup actually the edg was using so i've talked a lot about this default viper setup where you have uh you know a viper lineup here and then you have the orb here and i've talked about why that's a really good setup for stopping the chambers being able to get a control of this a line but what happens if you want to put some pressure over towards b well edg go for that in this round they have a viper wall that goes like this and this is going to really help segment the round and actually we've already looked at this round uh, before but from a different kind of perspective and the person I want to drag your attention to here again is the Viper uh, This is Chishu who's gonna throw an orb lineup that lands around here So pay attention to that on the minimap that he's gonna be throwing at the start of this round Obviously you can see as well that EDG have to fend off a little bit of mid aggression at the start of this round as well But you should be able to see if the bitrate's decent enough that the orb has landed over here So if we speed up the round just a little We'll skip it forwards a little here. This is the round that we were talking about, where Kang Kang decided to exec into sight by using his rendezvous. And now if we pour our attention over to the double smokes and what they're up to on this round, instead of Kang Kang, you can see here that, again, if we zoom in on the minimap, the areas that they have to fight over are very, very small. If they bloom this smoke and bloom this wall, think about the area that the attackers actually have to pay attention to. It's tiny. They just need to clear close areas at the beginning with a prowler. And then once they, they can choose to either, you know, drop the wall and fight over this kind of area. Or they could choose to drop the orb and fight over this kind of area. And they can really pick and choose which areas they fight over, segmenting the map piece by piece and using their double smokes, really just a viper in this situation actually, until the map gets a bit bigger. And their fade utility and their raise utility to break this already quite small map into really bite-sized chunks. And so if we go back out to the main screen, you can see how they approach this. So they bloom the viper utility. This means they only have to focus on Nishao. They throw a prowler out as well that goes kind of forwards to push anybody back. They deal with Nishao. They're then able to turn their attention to Berlin. They get the trade onto Berlin. And this is all with that Viper setup um, in play, right? And then what they're going to do, as you can see here, because Aeyang's looking for it, they're going to throw a haunt into back sight. And this haunt clears out all of this area, if we pull up the minimap again, this haunt here is going to clear out this area between the Viper smoke and the Viper wall. So now you can drop the Viper smoke and you can now clear out this backside area and you now control all of this triangle that's split up by the wall. Now, of course, the next step being that you can then throw smokes here or smokes here, depending on whether or not you got kills and whether or not you want to take longer or shorter sight lines. And you can really piece by piece disassemble this site. Um, let's also take a look at another team who was running different setups. This is Foot. Now, Foot are the team that I mentioned before who were running the Sage and the Breach, but they still run double smokes. They're running Omen Viper, but they're running a different Viper setup over towards B. They've started their wall over here, and this is, again, using the same concept of segmenting B into a bunch of different chunks, but it's not so much designed on once you get into the site, it's much more about B main control. So they're planning not to use as much breach utility. Remember what I said earlier, if you have a sky on this map, you are dumping sky utility at the 
beginning of the round to take B main control if there's a Sky Chamber versus Sky Chamber fight there. Instead, Foot really want to save their initiator utility for when they get to the site, right? So they're going to try and take B main with as little util as possible. And this is how they approach it. They, f they first have, if we pull up the minimap here, they first have this area to worry about. And this area is fairly simple. You can flood it with bodies. It's a little difficult to uh, be fought over really heavily. So they're not too worried about this. You know, in theory, if you knew that they were fighting over this area, you could invest more utility as well. But this area, a little bit of a gimme based on where they've put their wall. Then the second area that they have to worry about is this area once they've actually dropped the Viper wall. And then the third area, if they put their wall up again, they have to worry about is just this area here. And then the fourth area, once they put their wall down, they can put smokes up here and here. And now they're actually execing into the site proper. But they've controlled all of this area first, which allows them to focus just on this and this site line, which is valuable. So let's watch it in action and see how they go about it. Yeah. So they're going to put up the wall. They use the aftershock. They drop the wall as the aftershock is about to pop. So this is when a player would be scurrying away. So they're hoping to catch them if there was somebody behind that um, behind that box. They're looking for the cipher cam in this instance, although not many teams are running the cipher here. And now you see they're taking a bit of control. As soon as the wall is available to put up again, they do. They put it back up. They clear this angle with a double face. And now they're in position to actually try to exec into the site. And for this, they have a breach ult. And we'll talk about the actual exec a little later on. But using the, the Viper um, smoke here in a different way. And if you're in your ranked games, maybe you'd want to have a think about, okay, what does my composition look like? Do I have a chamber or somebody that's going to be able to take B main control? Am I in this composition playing the Viper going to have the freedom to put my wall down just for map control am i playing with another smoker that's going to be able to do the rest of the map if you're the solo viper you're probably not going to be able to use this setup because you're going to have to actually use your setup to get into sites and, and be more useful on the execs in which case maybe the edg setup works a little better for you or the default attacking a setup um although you'll still find it a little difficult without some viper smoke lineups to be able to properly get into smoke uh, get into good positions if you're playing solo smokes on this map so let's let's move on a little bit and we'll talk a bit about the uh, chamber. Uh, sorry, not the chamber, the harbor. So one of the reasons why I really, really like harbor on this map is that it just feels natural. There are so many good sight lines where you can use your cascade. The high tide is a perfect distance, or no matter almost where, where you are. And I think Jake did a great example while playing for Cloud9 in this tournament of demonstrating how powerful Harbor can be because it just feels so versatile when comboed with the Viper. You don't feel like you're really lacking anything because you have to be close by to your utility. So let's have a look at what they do here. This is round six, and we're going to see this kind of default setup that I've been talking about where Jake is going to use his high tide to block mid and give his teammates prio over this kind of angle, right? Over towards mid here. And then when the A pressure comes through, Jake is going to come over and use his reckoning. So the cascade gets used to start with. So if you look on the, uh, we'll have a look on the minimap here so that we don't get distracted by what EDG are going for because it is very interesting. We'll talk about it later. But just to focus on the harbor for a moment, the harbor's used their wall down here. Cascade has been thrown in this direction, so it blocks off here. So if the attackers were going up this kind of alley, they would now be blocked off by a cascade. And then Jake is going to come in and he's going to be able to use his Reckoning, which is insanely powerful on this map, w way better than the Omen Ultimate if you're going to compare like to like. And he's going to be able to stop this push from happening. So we can go back into the monitor kind of setup here and have a look at things. Smoggy is about to get stunned. Decides to go for the more aggressive of the options of swinging in, which is a mistake. And Jake ends up picking off Smoggy. And Jake, just by coming in here, despite the fact that both of the A-side anchors are dead, has actually halted this push and ended things in a 3v3 where he can now buy some time for his teammates to be uh, assisting him. So excellent usage of the Harbor Ultimate and Harbor Utility in this round from Jake. And he also, you know, he goes for some other stuff here, like throwing down his cove to try and clear alley and that kind of stuff. But, the, you know, the cove is also surprisingly versatile on this map because there's a lot of choke points where it just fits very nicely. Um... Let's have a look at what he's going to be doing when he's on the attack side as well. So this is a, another setup that Chambers like to do. Uh, Kang Kang is on top of a box here with a high ground setup that if you're an omen and you smoke here, the chamber can actually see over the top of it. Now, if you're a harbor, 
suddenly that doesn't work as well. Because now Kang Kang doesn't have this sightline that he would be able to have if Cloud9 were playing with an omen instead of a harbor, right? He would be able to see over the smoke and Kang Kang's setup would be fantastic. But now because this harbor is in his face, because this high tide is in his face, now Kang Kang can't really do anything. And not only does this high tide block off this area, it also blocks off the choke point here making it versatile, excellent for an A exec to come through like this. And there are so many spots on the map where this kind of trend follows through. And if you take a look, I'll just bring up the minimap again so that we can follow Jake very specifically. Cloud9 are going to take a lot of alley control. And here comes the Cascade. And the Cascade is going to come through for when the high tide falls. So this Cascade could end here if you wanted it to, or could push all the way forwards here. Either are super possible, depending on how your team wants to play. In this instance, Jake just decides to throw it as he did before to kind of level on the same way. And you have the Viper on the fly throwing one of these walls too because they decided to go for a fast A exec rather than going for any kind of default. So they didn't feel like they needed to use it in the common spot like this. So yeah, the double smokes just having so much variety and versatility when you combine them with the harbor. Um, and to show you guys what it's useful for over towards B as well, so this is, again, Jake over on B. He's going to put a cascade up here, get up into this position, high tide like this, and it's fantastic for blocking off anybody that would be watching from market, blocking off anybody that would be watching from spawn, and allowing his team to path like this into the site. So we'll have a look at it. Cascades takes a bit of map control. Now, you can combine that cascade with a flash if you want as well. Seems very reasonable to me. They have a boom bot that they can use to try and push people away in market. Now, one of the potential issues you could argue is that Jake does actually have to cross market. You have to actually cross the market sight line in order to do this high tide. But if you're double facing with multiple teammates, you're probably going to trade out favorably there, though there is a chance that you lose your harbor. And you see here, high tide being used. Not just that, but the reckoning poured on top of it as well. Chichu actually gets a kill through the Reckoning, but nobody wants more. Forced to go aggressive, or not just forced, but I mean, it's nobody, so of course he's going to go aggressive. And he ends up feeding into the Harbor Alt again, as he did in the prior example. So once more, the kind of, the value from the smokes, the pressure that it applies, the value from the ultimate as well, the fact that it blocks off certain high ground spots, all seem to me to be an excellent reason to pick Harbor on this map. But if you were going to go with Omen, what would you do with it? So if you want to play Omen on this map, I think you can play it a bit like a quasi-chamber, which seems like a ridiculous statement to say. But if you're going to have a defensive setup that looks a bit like this, where you have your Viper and your Sky over towards B, which is really standard, very common, and you have your Initiator holding down Market. Well, in this kind of instance, normally we've seen the Smoke player kind of playing a rotate spot up here, where they can rotate over this way or that way. But what Itsu does in this situation for T1 is that he tucks in and plays very aggressively and uses the fact that he has his TPs and his paranoia to be able to take an aggressive line um, and then still be able to escape. So we take a look at Itsu here. The dog goes in the opposite direction. Itsu finds a kill and he has many options here. He's worried about getting traded, so he just swings a little bit at the beginning to see whether anyone's there. He doesn't want to get caught trying to escape, right? So he's looking for the trader. Okay, he thinks, no trader. So now he backs off. He goes for the teleport and he's got a couple of options here. In this kind of situation, he could go for another teleport out like this. Remember, the trademark is covering his back, so he can do that without being afraid. He could throw paranoia to stop them from scaling onto him. He could tuck in this corner and then decide to paranoia afterwards. He could tuck in this corner and then decide to smoke this off. He has tons of different options for what he wants to do after he's found this first pick. And if you think about it, if the attacking team has to spend a lot of their utility flushing a chamber out of this spot or flushing an omen out of this spot, think about like, okay, if, if the attacking team is going to dog, which side do they dog? Do they want to dog this way because the chamber can be over there playing a rendezvous here? Or do they want to dog this way because the chamber could be playing a rendezvous here or the omen could be tucked in this spot? Or do they want to try and use their sky utility over towards B because the chamber is often going to be playing in B main? You know, when teams are only going to be running one initiator on this map, which is the meta currently, it, the more offensive threats that you can pose as the defenders, 
the more spots you can hide in, the more ways that you can play in aggressive positions and force them to flush you out, the more chances you're going to get to be able to find picks like Isu just did because they will use their utility to flush out a different spot because they're scared about a different area. And if you can have your omen and your chamber play like that, it puts a lot of pressure on the attackers. And that's not something that the harbor can really do. And if we want to talk about aggressive, take a look at this from EDG. So we're going to focus our attention here on Haodong. So I think we've taken a look at this round before, actually, but we're, we're going to take a look at it here. So you can see here with the full setup that Chishu is going for a snake bite lineup right now. So here is Chishu, and he's going to send his snake bite over to about where Vanity is stood, right here. And then they're going to omen smoke this area as well. And the snake bite pushes people out of the omen smoke so that Haodong can TP into it. So let's take a look at what this actually looks like in practice. It's an incredibly cool strat. And this isn't the first time that they've run it. They ran it in a Chinese tournament as well, so I'll show you that example. But here you see Haodong actually gets inside Vanity's orb and TPs into or right next to his own smoke and then comes out of it behind Vanity to be able to get this kill. This is also synced up with a haunt. It's beautiful. So there's another thing that you just simply wouldn't be able to do with Harbor. And this is, for, of course, the round where we were breaking down what Jake was doing on the other side by throwing the Cascade here and the High Tide here and putting the Reckoning on the side. So both Smokes players getting large value, but in very different ways with their Harbor and their Omen. Um, so let's take a look at this one now as well. So I said that um, I said that we, we'd take a look at this example uh, again too this is um actually i don't know whether we've seen this round forget what i just said but again we're going to be paying attention to the omen so this is the round we actually have seen this yeah we definitely have so this is the round where edg went for their um went for their haunt play uh sorry not haunt play nightfall play so they're night falling into sight but the important part about this is what haodong gets up to here so watch haodong on this exec so he is going to take his omen ult and ult into this little corner diag on A. So he's blocked off by this diagonal box and he's ulted in. Nobody's really heard him on the defender's side because they all got hit by the nightfall. And he's now in a phenomenal position. Whippy has no idea. The smokes have gone down. Paranoia as well. Haodong swings out and takes out Whippy and Jake. A masterful A attack by Haodong. The ideas that he's come up with as the IGL for this team of how to make the Omen useful on the attack side are just fantastic. And especially considering that this map has just come out. There are problems, however, with the Omen smokes. And this is one of the ones that I want to pay attention to here. This is the A exec. This is an Omen smoke that you might throw with this Viper wall. I said some teams are doing this Viper wall, right? And so you take a look at the minimap here. This smoke is the one that we want to pay attention to right here. And it's just too small. This gap between this default box and this wall is too large, really, for an omen smoke to be able to fill the gap properly. So when you take a look at what happens, the first one the first one is really only obvious by looking at the minimap. But you see A Young taking an angle there, being able to find a little gap. And if you look at what's happening, A Young has just pushed in front of the Viper wall and he's found a gap kind of past here where he's able to take a look and find an angle into this tunnel into the alley and you'll be able to see it better from his perspective in just a moment you look at Aeyang here look at this angle right this omen smoke is not very good and this is what i'm talking about even though omen has a lot of options of getting aggressive on this map and trying to find value and playing some high ground positions the smokes are just not as good as the harbor smokes and I think that's what you're going to be doing most of the time. You're not normally going to be trying to TikTok people. So for the final part of this video, because I said that we were going to do it in two parts with the more uh, complex stuff in the second part, this is where I want to talk about Foot's composition. So Foot are playing a comp here with the Sage and the Breach, right? So this is instead of running the Sky, they've got a Breach. And instead of running the Chamber, they've got a Sage. But they don't actually play the composition in any way similarly, in my opinion, to the other um to the other comps you know normally in that those kind of situations you would see 
the Chamber and the Sky playing together a lot. Well, you don't see the Sage and the Breach playing together that much with the way that they approach uh, the map. It's much more about getting big value out of the Breach utility because there are a lot of these alleyways that are just getting filled up, so uh, filled up by a fault line. So, for example, in this situation, uh, Guy says put a fault line down here at the beginning. And I should mention, Geiss is a sub as well. He's their coach. But he still understands how to play breach on the map really nicely. You can see the fault line has gone down here. You can just see the edge of it right there. So this fault line is putting pressure on your boy Lewis. And this is also comboing with the boom bot to allow CNED to take very early control up this side of the map. The play that they have to adapt? Well, you can really ask for. Hunter's Fury, immediately. They've also got um, a slow orb there as well. That they've put down so they're they're slow orbing they're going for the the fault line of course in this instance they got put off a little bit by the sova alt as well but this is how they're taking map control over on this side uh they're not really paying attention to anybody that could be playing here like in the classic kind of chamber setup or an omen that might want to you know be playing on the the right side towards the alleyway um but they always do have the option of being able to throw the viper orb in that spot anyway so it's not like it's a hole in their default um, they also end up coming in here and aftershocking towards the Diag spot for their exec. So after they get stalled out a little bit by the Silver Alt, guys is going to start moving forwards. Atta Captain's gotten fairly deep here. And as they go for their exec, Nade comes over the top. And in this situation, they've gone for a stun that goes across here again over towards your boy Lewis. And they've also gone for an aftershock that clears out this area towards Diag too. So they're putting a lot of pressure in onto the site with their breach utility. Um, here's us returning back to this round that I said I would talk about with Foot. They've, remember, they've already taken B main control with this Viper wall that we discussed, and now they're going to breach all into the site. One of the things I'm going to talk about in my second video is how important it is for defenders to hold back site B control. This map is really heavy on the defenders being able to control this area of the map because you have a little high ground here that's difficult for the attackers to get through and a very tiny choke point on the other side it's not really the same as other maps that have a pillar in the middle so with that in mind right with a sneak peek that you need to as a defender hold on to back b site control look at how good the breach hull is of just stopping that from being a factor so you have Nade comes through, the Breach Hell comes through. Nobody is possibly holding backside in this situation. They've just got eviscerated, if they were here, by either the Raise Nade, the Sage Slope, the Breach Hell. They are getting pounded in this situation. So that's another big reason why Breach Hell would be super valuable on this map. It allows you to take the whole site at once instead of piecing it off. Um, and if you piece it off, you allow more opportunities for the defenders to be able to get into ratty situations. And here's another situation where the breach ends up being really valuable. So this is a series of staggered flashes to push your boy Lewis out of market. So you've got a boom bot that comes down here. You have a paranoia to push him out of any close kind of positions. And then as the paranoia pushes him back, you have a breach flash that posh, pops here. So the paranoia pushes you into the breach flash and the boom bot's pushing you away the entire time as well. And all of this... It's basically unavoidable unless you run completely out of market. All of this allows them to get the Sage Wall down and now Foot have market control. How would you dodge that? Unless you're able to completely turn the Breach Flash, which of course people will get better at the more that they play against Breach on this map. Unless you completely turn the Breach Flash and dodge the Boom Bot and look for a kill, you're going to have to give market control here or throw some very good counter defensive utility. Uh, and so this was able to win Foot the market control every time that they did it um i now want to point out that uh the sage wall being used here in market so where else does the sage wall end up getting used now foot are a bit of a weird team because cracks basically only plays sage and ko um i guess he plays a little bit of gecko as well sometimes but he's got a really weird agent pool so he's also got some of the best raw aim in the entire world but he does have a really weird agent pool so they don't look like they fully fleshed out what they want to do with the Sage on the attack side, but they are using the Sage wall in very, like, standard spots like this, for example, where after they all path through on the A hit, 
They're using the sage wall up here so that they only have to worry about the retakers coming from this direction. So, you know, just standard stuff. And I think the sage will probably not be a meta pick on this map, which is why I haven't focused on it as much in this video. But I do think that they're getting some decent value out of it in general. The, one of the big issues that you might run into, however, with running the sage is that in theory, you might not have, whoopsie daisy, in theory, you might not have as much defensive capability because you're not running the chamber, right? And we talked about how good the chamber is at being able to set up down this, this line. And so I wanted to show you one of the kind of default setups that Foot was using. And in this situation, it might look like B is a little weak because you have, you know, a player here that's very easy to rotate over to A. So in theory, you could have 3A really quickly. Um, but, and, and mid is still being defended fairly well by two players that can combo together, but B looks a bit weak. If you were running into a fast B hit or some kind of, like, um, B split, it looks like maybe that would be a bit of a weakness, but to be honest, the Sage and the Viper are so difficult to get through. If you have your orb here, which is a place where Foot was running it a lot, that's a bit of a pain in the ass. But at the same time, if you're also um, just putting the orb in a more default spot over towards here, this is still a bit of a pain. Foot were also running a B retake wall quite a lot of the time. Um, that also makes it a little more difficult for defenders to split through. So they weren't trying to hard anchor B as much with these kind of setups. But still, think about trying to get through um, mid here in a situation where you're going through a sage you're going to get slowed you're going to get potentially walled off you're going to get slowed again you're going to have to drain the sage out of tons of utility and if you do try to go into a you've got this one-way smoke that isn't amazing but it's all right you've got a fault line that can come through as well you've got flashes that can pop through this wall you've got paranoia that you have to deal with and you have the rays that's going to try and rotate in too um they also have oops sorry i guess i've uh not written this one down when I was intending to actually, but, oh, I did, sorry, I did. So they also have a different defensive setup here, which I'll showcase, which looks a little like this. I forgot that Valorplant had sequences. So this is more of a, you know, defensive setup where the Rays and the Viper are going to hard anchor over towards B, and they have three players over towards A in this kind of situation, seeing if you can get a free Sage Wall up. And if the Sage Wall doesn't get broken, well then, then you're going to be able to rotate these players off the map and the sage is just going to be able to make the map so much smaller in theory also you could start the omen way further away because i think the sage and the breach can delay for long enough for the omen to be able to rotate in so mid isn't as open as it is with this default setup and you know in this kind of situation again if the sage manages to get the wall down properly then the sage and the breach you know without it getting broken i mean then the sage and the breach can start to rotate away and look over towards mid and the omen can start to fill in market so there's definitely good ways of being able to play this on the defense even though you don't have a chamber but it does rely a little bit on still fighting over this A choke point. And this is where the chamber, in my opinion, absolutely excels. Again, one of the core parts of this map is that if you lose control of this area as the defenders, you then have to be worried about both sides of A, and the map becomes a lot more difficult to try to hold on to. So that one was a little shorter than my previous video, but we still went for over 45 minutes just talking about the kind of basic aspects of why people are playing these kind of comps on Sunset. In my next video, which I'll put out in a couple of days, um, although I've already recorded it, uh, we're going to talk about some of the set pieces that people are running, some cool execs, some cool retakes that we've seen from EDG, that kind of thing. What the pace of the map is going to look like. Is it going to be a fast-paced map or a slow-paced map? And some important areas to fight over and cool angles that you might want to try as well. So keep tuned for that. Hit the subscribe button if you want to see more uh, Valorant analysis videos like this. And there's going to be a video that's recommended to you. Apparently, the algorithm thinks that you're particularly going to like.